Well, church, we have the honor of introducing a guest speaker this Sunday, a good friend of mine. His name is Greg Alquist. He's a teacher at Webster, and he's going to be preaching on us today. Can we welcome him as he comes today? So uh, I am uh, starting to get older, and it's coming crashing uh, into me and the realization in multiple fronts. I was having a conversation um, with a good buddy of mine real recently, and uh, he was talking about how in his office space one day, he was kind of noticing that uh, he wasn't kind of as rock solid as he liked, and he was paying attention particularly to his neck. Um, and, and, and some of you understand, right? And, and so, so he, what he started to do was Google on the computer. He wanted to find um, different ways that he might be able to address this aging issue. Um, and what he found was lots of advice. Um, and so he started to implement some of it. There's actually some training videos, apparently, on your neck. And so what he started to do was like this. He said, and he would and be like, and, and, and he was doing this, and then he found one that, that kind of had multiple progressions to the side, and so he was like, and he was just hoping that no one was coming into his office. And he, and he, and he does one to the left, and he's like, ur, ur, and he, oh, and then he pulled something right in his neck. And, uh, and, and, and he said, it was painful. And he lived the rest of the day kind of walking around. And, you know, the Internet has all kinds of advice for us, um, not the least of which, apparently, are neck exercises. Um, and they can be tempting to address the needs that we have. And we face all kinds of temptations, it seems to me. Some are trivial, like the one that I just mentioned, but others are serious and border onto addiction and things that will affect and profoundly shape our lives. And so I want to talk just a little bit about temptation, but I want to begin from this premise this morning, and if you have the handout, this will be the first one, um, that I'm beginning from the premise that temptations are all the things that try to take the center place of our lives. What I'm really going to be talking about here today is about identity. And what do we put at the center of our lives? Because there are multiple temptations that come and crash in on our lives. Look, let's get this started right off the bat. All right, this is an audience participation moment. All right, you ready? How many of you in the last year have faced some form of temptation? That's great. Did you notice that every hand was raised unless... The person next to you is sleeping, right? I mean, this is, we need to begin from the premise that we all face temptation. And you realize that every person that has ever walked the planet has, in fact, faced temptation. And that includes Jesus. He faced temptations. And what I want to do today, I want to do, look at, at three quick things, is number one, I want to look at the temptations that Jesus faced, because I think they're instructive for us to kind of look and evaluate our own life. Secondly, I want to look at a definition of how we might start facing that and look at the life of John, because I think there might be some clues about how we address temptation. And then thirdly, I'm going to end super quick with just some quick practical steps in kind of addressing and interrupting temptation, the way that God can kind of break into our lives. But I want to begin here with this diagram. So uh, you'll also see this on the flip side of that handout that you're probably on. And this is where I want to operate from. And the first bubble that I want you to fill in is kind of the center circle, because this is the place that I want to talk about identity. You see, this is, this is where we live. This is our heart. This is our soul. And, and what we, and, and everything around us, these other three circles, we're going to fill in the temptations that are trying to crowd in and define who we are. But see, when we talk about temptations, this is, it's a very, very tricky subject because what are we talking about? We're talking about all the ways that we think, all the ways that we act, all the things that we say, all the things that we feel. We're getting at the motivations. When we're talking about temptation, we're actually talking about how we choose to live life. And it's so significant that we take time to carefully identify what is at the center of my life and what is driving and moving and shaping the decisions that I make. 
So everybody has faced temptations, including Jesus. Of course we know that the one difference is that Jesus did not give in to temptation. But can I just suggest this? A lot of people stop right there that Jesus is just the example. And what I want to suggest is is not just the example of the way to fight or to combat temptation. No, I think Jesus is actually the one who provides the solution. And the solution is actually found in relationship with him. Because if we only fight temptation by trying not to do something, we're probably going to go around the same mountain another time. I think we have to passionately pursue what's at the heart of our identity. And that is, just to give away the end and the beginning, it is our identity as people who are loved by Jesus. So I want to look here uh, ever so quickly at these three, at the temptations of Jesus. So here's what I want you to do. Um, Look, you all are seated next to somebody, whether you like them or not, doesn't really matter to me. Would you turn to them and see how many temptations you can name, you two can name together, or a small group of you, how many you can name right off the top of your head? Ready? This, go. You've got like 30 seconds at most. All right, you're a talkative bunch. I like it. You're, you're, obviously, you're having a theological conversation about what they all mean, right? All right, so here we go. Even though we're in a big room, let's do it super quick. Um, can somebody, somebody that's brave out there, give me one of the temptations? What? Power. So he is offered power. He's actually, the, Satan takes him up onto this big mountain and shows him kind of the, the everything and says, you can have authority and power over all this. Absolutely. Good. Got another one? Stone into bread. He kind of offers that one. There's a good common one. Nice. Anyone got another one? What? what? Yeah. And, and that is a later one. That's absolutely right. And here's the, yes. And the other thing is he offered, he says, worship me. And then he takes him up onto the top of the temple. What does he ask him to do right up there? Jump off. So let's break these down real quickly on what each of these mean. So the first one, let's look. The devil said to him, if you are the son of God, tell this stone to become bread. And Jesus answered, it is written, man shall not live on bread alone. And so here's the first one. The first temptation that Jesus faces is the the stone into bread. But what does it mean? And here's where you're going to fill it out. It is the temptation that I am what I have. And there's an important context that I want to back up just ever so quickly here. Is that Jesus had been out into the desert, as many of you know, and he had been fasting. And, and, and this is the context of it. But there's one even before it. You see, the story that happens right before the temptations is that Jesus is baptized. And after he is baptized, do you remember the words that he hears? God speaks audibly and says... This is my son whom I love, and I am well pleased. And he speaks that into Jesus' life. And I think he's speaking that into our lives this morning. And do you see the assault that happens as soon as that identity as one who God loves is this is the first one, that no, you're not actually that person. What you are is what you have. And this makes a lot of sense in our world, doesn't it? That we are defined by the things we have and by the consumption and what we have, whether we have a nice car or a nice home, that we're always after more. And there always can be a next step. And if those things that we don't have become the preoccupation, they will start to crowd in on the center place of our lives and we will begin to build our lives around acquiring more because our hunger will never be satisfied for those things. And so how do we respond when we don't get something or we don't have something are we willing to wait 
And there's a whole bunch of applications, not just material to this that I might suggest, is that and I think one of the reasons that pornography is such a, a, an epidemic amongst people in the church and outside the church is that there is an inability to wait and be patient and to satisfy pleasure and put that above my identity as one who is loved. But this isn't the only one. The second one is the devil led him up to a high place and showed him in an instant all the kingdoms of the world. And he said to him, I will give you all their authority and splendor. It has been given to me and I can give it to anyone I want to. If you worship me, it will be all yours. And the two words that I, uh, that I focus on here are authority and splendor. That here he is, Satan takes him up and he's got all of this and he says, I can give this to you and you can rule. And the temptation here is to believe that I am what I do. And this, this makes a lot of sense in the way that we live lives, in the way that, that so often we are, at, we are asked to worship our work and to bow at the altar of success, as John Ortberg says. That we can start to build our lives when our work is the most important thing. It can consume every facet of what we do. And we can start to define ourselves by how well I am doing in my job. And when I am promoted and when I am recognized, then my life is good. And when I am unrecognized and when I do not have the job that I want or I am unemployed, then I am worthless. You see, the first one is, if I have much, then I am much. And if I don't have much, then I'm not much. The second one is, if I do this well, and if I am successful, then that's what defines. And the third story is that the devil led, led Jesus up to Jerusalem and had him stand on the highest point of the temple. He says, if you're the son of God, throw yourself down from here. For it's written, he will command his angels concerning you to guard you carefully. They will lift you up in their hands so that you will not strike your foot against a stone. By the way, interesting note that Satan knows scripture, right? And he's actually quoting it. But Jesus answered, it is said, do not put the Lord your God to the test. And this one is that Jesus could have thrown himself off and everyone would have seen in that crowded temple area. And the temptation here that crowds into our life is that I am what others think of me. That others people, other people's opinions and approval and my own reputation becomes the driving force of what I do and what I don't do do. It is that desire to be loved, to be recognized, to be the greatest that's driving this one. And all three of these are crowding into our lives, uh, that, that we are what we have, that we are what we do, and that we are what other people think. And here's the problem, is that when we start living our lives around each or any or some combination of those, then when our circumstances go well, then we think our lives are going well. And when they don't go well, then we feel like our life is crumbling apart, and so we need something else to anchor our lives in our identity. And it's actually found in those words that God spoke to Jesus. And he said, this is my son whom I love. When we begin to shape our lives around that, life looks different. And of course, we know that there are, there's an entire industry, the advertising industry, the marketing industry is, in, is built around telling you that these three circles around are actually much more important, right? So here's some quick images just to illustrate this. Right here is that I am what I, what I have. Here is what I am what I do. Here is that I am what people think of me. And when those things start to shape us, When life happens, 
when we face a situation like Ben was talking about at the end of worship, what are we going to turn to? He's good. He's good. He's so good. And so at the center of our identity has to be the fact that Jesus loves us. And see, the problem isn't just with the, uh, with the advertising industry. The, the problem is actually seeps into who we are. And actually, it plays out in a whole host of different ways, not just actions, but also subtlety. And I think about social media, and I think about the images that we project on social, social media, whether it's on Twitter or Instagram or Facebook, if you're ancient like me, right? And so you've got all of these photos. Here, let me show you. These are the ways that I want to project myself, right? Things that I've done, things that I have have things that I really want right and, and th these are the images that we have and everything looks great and everything looks perfect but the reality of my life if I'm really being honest is that I'm actually a person that when I came to this church uh, three four three and a half years ago is that I was overwhelmed outside there and didn't feel like I knew people and felt kind of disconnected and was actually overwhelmed by that many people. The reality is, is that I'm a person that likes to hold on to the things that I have and I wrestle with generosity. And if you don't believe me, ask my wife. I think she laughed the loudest, by the way. I realize that I love my job and what I do and yet... I am all too aware that it starts crowding into all the spaces of my life. Then I have to manage that and realign. And here's the reality of these temptations, folks. It's not social media and posting a different narrative on social media is not the answer to social media. The answer is that I need to realign my life and center it on the identity that really matters. In essence, the answer is Jesus. And that is what, and that's that is the takeaway this morning. That these three things, while they are crowding and there is a constant assault on them and on our souls to see who it is that is at the center and what is at the center of our identity, is that we have the opportunity to reassess, to realign, and to refocus and declare war on those things that are tempting us and to go hard after Jesus. So let's look at John, because John's life is so instructive in this way. So the, the, the backstory to John, and just super quick, is that John has an interesting identity. Jesus names him as one of the sons of thunder. Lots of great ways to illustrate it. You know, John is the guy that's like super excited, and he goes out for ministry, and, and he kind of gets rejected out there. And by the way, you could start to interpret it in light of any of those three. And so he goes back to Jesus, and he says, hey, those people, they weren't really receptive. Should we just call them? On fire and Jesus is like whoa tiger <laughs> back it white right up and John is also the guy that he goes to Jesus and he says hey hey Jesus can you just give me one thing and Jesus is like well go ahead and ask and he's like hey can me and my brother James can we each be on the right and left side of you up in the kingdom of heaven and Jesus is like whoa <laughs> And if that wasn't enough, there's another story of his mom going and asking the same thing for her, for her two sons, which is some interesting family dynamics, to be sure. But John is this guy. He's this passionate guy, right? So I'll set the stage for this, for this scripture. And it is at the Last Supper. And Jesus has just gone around and he's, he's washed the disciples' feet. And he's just told them about this news about what is coming. And so I want to pick it up right here. And he says, after he had said this, Jesus was very troubled in spirit and testified, very truly I tell you, one of you is going to betray me. And his Disciples stared at one another at a loss to know which of them he meant. And then this is, the, this is the verse that I want us to focus on. He said, one of them, the disciple whom Jesus loved. The one whom Jesus loved was reclining next to him. And Simon Peter motioned to the disciple and said, hey, 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 you ask him which one he means. And leaning back against Jesus, he asked him, Lord, who is it? 
You see, I think John actually has caught a lot of flack, and actually from myself earlier, I'm like, oh yeah, so you're the one? You're the only one? I actually think John deeply owned it, and he said, yes, I am the one. But see, God's love is so amazing that it is not exclusive. And his love for me does not diminish in any way his love for you and for you and for all of us. And so the challenge is, can we allow that identity to sink deeply into our lives? And for those of you that are young people in the room, this, this is the place to put the stake in the ground on who you are. Because all of life will be an assault on what that identity is. And if you put the identity in the ground, you put a stake in the ground that I am the one who Jesus loves, then it doesn't matter what happens in the rest of life. It doesn't matter if you have plenty or you're in want. It doesn't matter if you get that job or you're delayed and you live in a season of unemployment. It doesn't matter whether people love you or whether you are rejected by everybody because what matters is that I am loved and that means I'm successful. And when you put that stake in the ground... All of life, all of life looks different because this becomes what is at the center of our lives. I am the one who Jesus loves. So a number of years ago, my wife uh, faced a, a serious health trial. Um, she had a non-cancerous tumor on her pituitary gland. And we weren't sure how it was actually going to be addressed because literally the pituitary gland is in the center of your head. And so they tried treating it with, med with medication, tried a whole host of different approaches, and none of them seemed to work. And so the last option was surgery. And they were going to go in and get it in the middle of her head. And so there we are, fairly young with just one kid, facing the prospect of brain surgery. And I remember the night before, we had dropped off Anna at uh, my, my sister's house. And we were sitting across the table from each other. And so we're kind of like in this awkward space. And it's almost surreal. In fact, it is surreal. And she looks at me and she says, so you've been a great husband. And I was like, are you kidding me? <laughs> but I will never forget just a couple of days before that. We were walking up the stairs to go to church. And as we are about to walk in the door, I remember walking in, and all of a sudden, I just, I had an encounter with the Lord, by the way, and it's encounters that are the ways that God interrupts temptation. And the Lord came, and I just had this deep sense inside of me, and it just welled up. There was this moment of faith that was inspired by this encounter, and I just said to the Lord in that moment, it doesn't matter what the outcome is here, whether it's good or whether the worst possible outcome happens, I am still in this, and I will follow you forever. And I put a stake in the ground, even though I had followed him since I was a young teenager, but that moment was a stake in the ground that it didn't matter what happened around. My identity was found in the fact that I was loved. And the good news is that that is the identity that all of us get to claim. So let me give some quick practical next steps to interrupt this temptation. Number one is simply what we just talked about, and I think it's the most essential. What is at the center, and let's go hard and passionately pursue it. Number two, I think is really, really important. We need to own scripture. Dan Nichols was the one that talked about this at Youth Sunday, that it is knowing scripture that actually fights those temptations, which was really, really, really good. Thirdly, can I encourage us to confess it? You need to find somebody that you trust and name it, especially when it comes to fighting for purity and fighting against 
addictions like pornography, it is important to name it and say it to somebody that you trust. And perhaps that is just a friend, but in certain cases and in certain temptations, especially where it is spilled over into addiction, I would encourage you to confess it to a pastor or to a professional and declare war on it and go after it. The fourth is prayer, and I don't want to in any way diminish the power and and, and importance and centrality of prayer because it's what connects us to the Lord and what allows him to break through and move in an encounter. Fifthly, I think it is about finding deep friendships. You want to know the way? the, The answer to that social media question is that if I am this person, I need to go and find somebody else and tell them who I really am and walk through that with that person. It's about deep, authentic, and real friendships that can help us to overcome temptation. And here's the last one, is to tell our story and to rehearse it. You see, I was reminded of that story about Amy and me in the context of our life group. That we all sat around in our life group and we were telling ways that God had broke through and, and the ways that he had, he had moved inside and outside of our stories. And I think it's so powerful to rehearse and to tell those stories. And by the way, by the way, John wrote that phrase and statement of his identity at the end of his life. That he realized who he was. And he was, through that scripture, telling us what his identity was. And so the question on the table for us is, what is at the center of our identity? Can I have the worship team come on up? I just want us to take a minute to realign, to take a minute to refocus. And are there places in our lives that we need him to break through and to realign. Would you stand and let's pray. Jesus, we recognize that we are, we are people that are, uh, we are so easily distracted and, and our lives can easily go off course. And yet, Jesus, this morning, we look to you as the one. We look to you as the author and the perfecter of our faith. We look to you as the source. And we ask, Lord, that you would break through, that you would give us an encounter with you. Because we know that you are good. And we know that your best intentions are for us. And so, Jesus, We take a minute to realign and to recenter and say and to name and to declare that we are a people.